Um, hello and welcome to The One Show with Matt Baker. And Alex Jones. Oh, what a lovely looking pair. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, now we're going all ooh matron tonight in, in honour of our special guest. Yes, he starred in 11 classic carry-on films and here he is making an entrance. Let's have a warm welcome for the daring Jim Dale. <laughs> now, Jim, we say daring. So we say oh, daring. Oh, that because, was wonderful. Yeah, you you did your own stunts, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, so what what would happen is I'd save the stunt until the last day. Yeah. And and then if I broke my neck, they said we'll give a do a wide shot and bring the uh, stunt man in. Bring, so, yeah. <laughs> was that the most dangerous one you did? No, no. The, actually, do, doing that stunt, I, I actually damaged my arm very badly. And the next day, it was in a, in a plaster cast. And that was the day in Carry On Again, Doctor, I had to jump into a, a hammock. Right. And then the hammock went through the floor, and the walls oh. came down on top of me. And Jim. as I was about to do it, he said, do keep your elbow up on your tummy, so, or you don't want to break your arm again as you go in. And could you, as you go in the hole, turn your face so we know it's you? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we know you love stunts, so we've got one set up for the end of the show. No, we haven't. We haven't. Lovely we trolley haven't. at the top of the stairs. <laughs> uh, now, we want to know if you have met any of the stars of the Carry On films. Uh, there's the lovely lot there, but I don't know. Perhaps you met uh, Kenneth Williams, Barbara Windsor, or maybe Sid James. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> He's in the room. Uh, send us your photographs to the usual address, and we'll show some at the end of the show. Now, Jim regularly took on the role of the Doctor in the Carry On film and was often ably assisted by an array of uh, rather saucy nurses. But how did the women who were really nursing back then feel about the carry-on films and was any of it true to life? Well, Alex Riley joined a reunion to find out. Some of the most iconic and memorable scenes from the whole carry-on series come from those films set in hospitals. By like that time when Frankie Howard shoots out the back of the ambulance! To Jim Dale's epic trolley dash. <laughs> These medical misadventures contain some of the funniest slapstick set pieces in British cinema history. <sighs> but what was life really like for nurses on the wards of the late 50s, 60s, and early 70s? To find out, we've brought together a group of retired nurses who cared for patients while the carry-ons were selling out the cinemas. So, were the carry-on films true to life? I saw several of the films and parts of them I thought, oh yes. <laughs> but a lot of it was just sort of slapstick. In the carry-on films, there's always a bit of romance bubbling under the surface. Did that really happen? We had a colonnade at the hospital, the uh, guys, you know, that occasionally we'd walk up and down in the hope of perhaps catching sight of somebody that you quite fancied, for instance. So were you secretly in love with any of them? No. <laughs> Take the stethoscope <laughs> away in the white coat and they're the same as everyone else. Did you have any difficult patients? There was always the odd one or two. <laughs> Even if it was only just by keep on ringing the bell. Now what? Oh dear, sounds as if you don't love me today. And can you plump my pillows up? In those films, the matron, she's sort of a monster, isn't she? It's matron's round. Well, mind your point. <laughs> the wards were regimented. Matron did do her round every day, and all the beds had to be very neat and patients sat up, whether they were comfortable or not. I once saw a patient having to be asked to put his cigarette out qu quickly, because he was actually in an oxygen tent. Jim, 
When you see that, does it feel like it was it was a long time ago, or does it feel no, quite no, recent? No, it doesn't feel. It feels like it was last year or something. I, I I feel the same now as I did when I was doing all those stunts. I don't feel old as, as I am. I feel about the same age now mm -hmm. as I did when I made those films. And it's it's a lovely. It seems as if it was just yesterday, but uh, my God, it's nearly 40 years ago. <laughs> Wow. And when you look back then, mm -hmm. you know, did you know then how popular the films would become and that, you know, four generations later people would Isn't still it? be watching them? Four generations. Mm. We didn't, I don't think any of us thought it would ever be accepted in, by the British Museum as a, the best example of 20th century British comedy. We didn't think that. We were just offered a, another job, another carry on film, and you'd mm -hmm. search through the script to see which part you had. I bet well, that was they, the interesting bit, was yes, it? Yes, because it had been written specially for you. It had been written specially for Kenneth oh. Williams, specially for Barbara right. Windsor. So those, that's why it became the repertory theatre of, of mm -hmm. the cinema. Mm -hmm. And uh, it made, we were a team like the Beatles, you know, as close as that really? while we were working. And was the real pressure then to stay within that group? Did it feel, or, or did you feel quite safe within it? Well, one felt very safe within it because these were professional comedic actors. They weren't comics, they were comedic actors. And therefore, a comedic actor or any actor, the first thing they do is give. You give to mm. each other, mm. knowing you're going to get back. Mm. And that's what each and every one of us did in that we gave to each other, we knew the spotlight would be on us at certain times and that they would be looking. And we in turn gave them the spotlight and we would support them. So it was a great team feeling which is what you get no matter what type of group you're in. You give and take, yeah. but most of all you give. And that comes across actually watching the films. Yeah. But even though you're proud of them, there's a lot more to your career yeah. um, <clears> than just the carry on films. And Just Jim, which is your new stage play, it looks at your journey really through your career from a, you know, being a pop star to yeah. a comedian, a dancer, a musician. Yeah. But it all started with an accidental trip didn't it? Actually it did, yes. It started long before then. I was about nine years of age when I went to the theatre. And I come from a very small town and the most noise you ever hear is that of a football team screaming. Mm -hmm. Two or three hundred blokes mm -hmm. screaming. So when you go to a West End show and you, you hear twelve hundred people screaming with laughter, to me it was magic. It was, that and was I, the moment. I just said that's that's what I want to do. Yeah. That. And so my parents were the type who say, right, it's your life. And we'll help you every bit we can. And if you have a passion this early, let's push you. Um, not a stage mother, not pushing me like that, but encouraging me to, t to search out how best to become a comedian, how best yeah. to learn about theatre. Dance. That's it. It gives you the movement. It gives you everything. And uh, mm -hmm. I s then from there into musical, from watching it to actually being in mm -hmm. it, and then realizing that every step in one's 60-year-old career has resulted in the experience you had from those early days of musical. Yeah. When you go to Shakespeare, suddenly you realize that Shakespeare's comics were the early musical guys, breaking the, or the fourth wall and speaking directly mm -hmm. to the audience. And I mean, you, you, you've, you've got that applause in so many different ways. I mean, you even, you were a pop star, weren't you, in 1957? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Even that relates to the musical yeah. because I'd been a musical comic in that same theatre where I was now a pop star. Yeah. And instead We've of. We've got the track as well. Let's play the music. Oh, stop we'll it. play the music oh, as well, on. Jim, while we're chatting. There you go. Oh, wonderful. Of all of this stuff, what are you most proud of? Surviving 65 years in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's longevity, isn't it? Yes, I suppose it is. But the, the joy of being able to be in show business so long is that you've had the ability to explore every conceivable type of branch of that wonderful showbiz tree. And having explored it, you may like to go even further or come back and take a different branch to get a different view of something else that mm -hmm. happens in show business. And I think over 60 years I've been able to really explore knowing that at some time in the future maybe what I'm exploring in the way of disc jockeying may help me later on and, and it did when it came to recording the Harry Potter books in America. Mm. The experience of, of being a uh, disc jockey helped tremendously that, yeah. sitting in front of a mic and, and recording all seven Harry Potter books. You know, a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what we love is what inspired your one-man show because it was your grandchildren, wasn't it? Absolutely, yes. Uh, I decided to put my, all these stories <coughs> into some sort of book. Not, <coughs> excuse me, not for sale. I didn't... My agent said a publisher wants to do it, but she wants to know a little more about your sex life. 
Oh. <laughs> I, I don't... But that has nothing to do with my career, and I want my grandchildren to remember me and their grandchildren to be able to read about who this guy was who did a lot of things in show business and perhaps yeah. brought a lot of joy to people. That's yeah. all. And then I looked at it and I thought, well, maybe there are a few other people who would like to share this. And so putting together a show with this wonderful director called Richard Maltby, who wrote Miss Saigon, who wrote Ain't Misbehaving. You know, get the best crowd around you, yeah. the best talent, the best pianist, Mark York, I have. And you've got something very special. So Richard condensed quite a lot of words into 16,000. That's two 16, hours. 16,000 words. 16,000 words. Yes. He said, you've got to memorize these. And he, I came <laughs> off one night, he said, you left a word out. Put it back tomorrow. Well, your audience will turn up, and I'm sure they'll count every single one of them. We wish you all the very best with it. Now, according to a new report published... Earlier on, we asked whether any of you had met some of the cast of the Carry On films. This one has come in from Chris Lloyd. Uh, he says, here's when I met the legendary Barbara Windsor. Lovely picture, that. Uh, look, Paul Streeting has sent this in. My photo with the late Kenneth Williams. This picture, Jim, is 40 years old, this picture. Happy birthday. Yeah. 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 That's a great picture. Uh, now, we've been talking classic British comedy tonight. And one thing that... To all of you who've sent in loads and loads and loads of photos, our We're inbox inundated with them. Totally inundated. Now uh, Norman Scott has sent this one in um, with a wonderful Frankie Howard. The go, on, Jim. go on, Jim. From Dean, who was ten years old when he met Jim Dale in London when he was <laughs> playing Fagin <laughs> in Oliver at the Palladium. Lovely. Well, that is it for today, and you can see Jim in his one-man show, just Jim Dale, at the Vaudeville Theatre in London, the 26th of May. 20th of June. I'll be here tomorrow with Richard Osman and our guest will be Claire Ball.